Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Carnegis, and joining me to introduce today's podcast is the man behind the curtain, Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests to appear on STEM Talk. Hi, Don. Great to be here. I've known Dr. Mark Lupo for a number of years and count him both as a friend and as an excellent physician. Dr. Lupo is the founder and medical director of the Thyroid and Endocrine Center of Florida, which is based in Sarasota, Florida. On the web, they can be found at thyroidflorida.com. Yeah, I didn't realize until our interview with Mark that thyroid cancer is one of the fastest growing cancers in this country. In fact, it seems nearly epidemic. Yeah. But before we get to today's interview with Mark, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we are especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews piling up on iTunes. As we announced in several earlier episodes, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing the iTunes reviews, with an eye toward selecting the wittiest and lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. As always, if you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. And cool t-shirt it is. Mm -hmm. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the nickname Lindsay14. The review is titled, IHMC Makes Science Accessible. The review reads, It is amazing to hear some of the top scientists in the world featured together in a fascinating way. Thanks, IHMC. Well, thank you, Lindsay14, and thank you to all the other STEM Talk listeners who have helped STEM Talk get off to such a great start. Okay, now on to today's interview with Dr. Mark Lupo. Dr. Mark Lupo, just like me, is a graduate of Duke University, go Blue Devils, who went on to earn his medical degree at the University of Florida, where he worked with the world-famous thyroid expert, Ernie Mazzaferi. Dr. Lupo also did his internship and residency in internal medicine at Florida, and then won a fellowship in endocrinology, metabolism, and nutrition at the University of California, San Diego, at the Scripps Clinic. Dr. Lupo's research and practice are particularly focused on thyroid nodules, which are abnormal growths of thyroid cells that form a lump within the thyroid gland. Although the vast majority of thyroid nodules are benign, a small proportion do contain thyroid cancer. His practice is centered on diagnosing and treating thyroid cancer at the earliest stage and helping people avoid unnecessary surgeries. He's also very involved in teaching neck ultrasound, thyroid cancer, and general thyroid disease to other physicians at the national level. He has published book chapters and several articles on thyroid disease and thyroid ultrasound. In addition to his work as the medical director of the Thyroid and Endocrine Center of Florida, he also is a clinical assistant professor on the faculty of the Florida State University College of Medicine. STEM Talk. STEM STEM Talk. talk. STEM STEM Talk. talk. STEM Talk. Hi, this is Don Cornegas, your host for STEM Talk, and I'd like to welcome Mark Lupo to the podcast. Mark, welcome to STEM Talk. Thanks, Don. It's great to be here. And also joining us today is Ken Ford. Hi, Don, and hello, Mark. So, Mark, you've had an interesting path that led you to being an expert in thyroid nodules and cancer. In fact, we are both Duke alum. Can you tell us about what led you to medicine? Uh, Of course. I went to Duke uh, thinking I would do anything but medicine or intense science. I was thinking maybe law school, business school, languages, and had the fortune during my second semester uh, freshman year to take a seminar with Keith Brody, who was the president of the university at the time and an accomplished psychiatrist. Unfortunately, he, as you know, passed away in December of 2016. And he was just a charismatic educator and took psychiatry, which I was interested in because my dad's a child psychiatrist, and and made it very scientific, more objective. And so I thought maybe medical science might be a good direction for me, thinking psychiatry perhaps. And to confirm my lack of interest in the other fields, I did an internship after my freshman year at Duke in a law firm and realized that environment was not at all for me. (laughs) I called the pre-med advisor from the law firm and said, I need to start this pre-med stuff when I get back sophomore year. (laughs) Get me started fast. (laughs) Exactly. 
So your interest turned from psychiatry to, to, to internal medicine. Um, how did you end up choosing endocrinology specifically uh, with a particular interest in thyroid nodules and cancer? So when I went to medical school, which was at the University of Florida, um, I was pretty open-minded but still thinking about psychiatry. As I did more of that, I projected out uh, to my future adult life thinking that's not exactly <laughs> what I want to do. It's not quite as objective as uh, my experience in my freshman seminar and really enjoyed the problem solving of internal medicine, very objective, didn't like the um, OR suites as much and taking my background in you know, competitive mathematics in high school thought problem solving you know, within humans is a, is a neat um, uh, potential career path for me. So I could do my interaction with people with I enjoyed that part of psychiatry, but at the same time, make it more objective. Mm -hmm. And so internal medicine was a natural fit for me at that point. That makes sense. And then, I mean, so you had asked a kind of a long career path question in mm -hmm. a very short time. So let's see. So then from the internal medicine part, I had the fortune of being at the University of Florida doing internal medicine when Ernie Mazzaferi, who was one of the international thyroid nodule and cancer experts, was trying to retire because his son was doing a cardiology fellowship in Gainesville. And he said, well, I'll just retire and be with you know, my son and grandchildren. But of course, the university recruited him quickly into doing rounds with us. And so after a few morning report sessions with Ernie Mazzaferi and talking more about endocrinology and thyroidology, uh, he, he really clinched my interest in that. Uh, well, that's awesome. So as you work to establish your practice and build your expertise in, in the area of thyroid nodules and cancer, you also had some pretty incredible adventures from what I understand. So how did you find time to climb Kilimanjaro and also climb to the base camp of Everest during this time? And how did those opportunities come about? Yeah, that, that's kind of funny because the Kilimanjaro climb um, was within three or four years of me being out of training. So at that time, I had more free time uh, to do something like that. And my um, wife and I were engaged at the time, and she uh, received a advertisement from her um, Thunderbird, which was her uh, graduate business school program, saying, here's this trip to Africa that, you know, for a Thunderbird alum. And I said, hey, there's this side trip to climb Kilimanjaro. Well, <laughs> while we're there, we should do that. And you know, then I started investigating it a little bit more and said, gosh, I live in Florida. I was born and raised in Florida. <laughs> I have no experience in altitude. There's nowhere to train in terms of climbing. So let's get our cardiovascular up to speed. We're, you know, we are regular exercises. So that wasn't as much the issue. It was an issue of going more vertical and also dealing with the oxygen, which, you know, low, uh, high altitude, low oxygen is, doesn't discriminate. You know, anyone could potentially get uh, sick no matter how fit you are. Yeah. So we, we found the time to try to train for that, and uh, um, it really had a great time. So that was in 2006 when we summited Kilimanjaro and sort of got the bug at that point. So we wanted to do another long trek, and then in 2009, uh, we took a, a two-week trek, and that was in part, that was going to the base camp of Everest. And that was humbling because when at Kilimanjaro, you summit and you get to the real top. At the base camp Everest, <laughs> your goal is someone else's beginning. Right. And so that was a little bit less uh, gratifying. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to move into your area of expertise. So although thyroid disease is of great interest and is manifested in many ways, today we're going to limit our discussion to thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. But before we dig into this topic, can you please provide an overview for our listeners on what the thyroid actually does? Absolutely. So it's a butterfly-shaped gland that sits at the lower front part of the neck. There's a left lobe and right lobe, and uh, it's about two inches long on each lobe and about a um, half inch uh, wide. So it's a pretty small gland. So normally you can't even feel it. So when we talk about thyroid nodules and cancer, you know, a lot of these we can't feel, but it produces an extremely important hormone called thyroxin. So thyroxin controls metabolism. When most people think about metabolism, they're thinking about the you know, the the media hype of thyroid and weight and all these things, but metabolism to a medical scientist has a lot more to do uh, than just weight regulation. So it's temperature regulation, nerve function, muscle function, heart function, uh, skin and hair and nail uh, growth patterns, uh, fertility issues. So thyroid hormone plays an integral role to almost every body function. So if your thyroid's not functioning, you're, you're simply not functioning. So just to clarify, is a thyroid nodule the same thing as a goiter? So 
A goiter means an enlarged thyroid. So one common cause of goiter would be a nodule or multiple nodules causing an enlarged thyroid or goiter. The other non-nodular cause of goiter is typically autoimmune thyroid disease. We call that diffuse thyroid disease, where the thyroid is attacked by the immune system and that inflammation causes growth and enlargement, but not necessarily with nodules. So goiter and nodules are distinctly different terms, but nodular thyroid is uh, can be a goiter or a multi-nodular goiter, for example. Mm -hmm. Hmm. The incidence of thyroid nodules and cancer seems to be epidemic. There's been a greatly increased incidence of thyroid nodules and cancer in the United States over recent decades, with the year-to-year -year increase running as high as perhaps 7% annually. While I understand that this incredible rate of growth may have slowed in recent years, depending, of course, on your data source, the literature shows somewhere between 49 and 72% of the female population having thyroid nodules. Although most of these nodules will not be cancerous, still roughly 10 to 13% of the US population does have a thyroid cancer on their thyroid gland, often very small. But the good news is that in most cases, it'll be well managed with good outcomes. Is there greater incidence of disease afoot here, or is this just better detection or some combination of both? Probably a combination. So as we you know, step back to the nodule question, that is clearly an epidemic and is the most common endocrine disease is a thyroid nodule. You think people think diabetes and insulin resistance, but the prevalence numbers you mentioned, Ken, of 40 to 70 percent of population, depending on study, having a nodule is is, is truly epidemic. Um, luckily, most of these are, are benign, um, but we end up investigating more nodules than we truly need to because we find them through uh, incidental discovery when people go for carotid artery studies with ultrasound or CT scans of the spine or neck or chest for other reasons. So 60% of the people I see for thyroid nodules are found by another imaging modality or serendipitously through um, you know, testing not specifically for a thyroid nodule. Um, yeah, some studies, you mentioned 10 to 13% being cancer. Some studies would say that there's a 30% rate of, of papillary microcarcinoma in, in the population. So that's all based on autopsy studies where people die for other causes. They do a careful dissection of the thyroid and find one, two, three millimeter uh, papillary thyroid cancers. Clearly, that's not clinically what we're looking for. So we've shifted in our nodule thought from you know, the three questions we ask when we see a patient with a nodule is one, it used to be one, is it cancer? Now to me, it's one, is there a clinically significant cancer in a, the sense that if I don't intervene, the patient will have a bad outcome. So that's my cancer question now, not a yes, no cancer, but is it a cancer that we're worried about? Number two, is the patient having symptoms? And some people present with trouble swallowing, trouble breathing, and those are you know, often benign nodules, but they need to be treated. And thirdly, is the nodule impacting thyroid function? Some nodules will become autonomous, so they'll produce a uh, thyroid hormone because they have a mutation in the TSH receptor, so it doesn't pay attention to the normal feedback from the pituitary, and then continue to uh, secrete thyroid hormone. So those need to be treated because that excess thyroid hormone can cause bone loss and heart rhythm problems. So the question, we used to think that this increase in the incidence of thyroid nodule and thyroid cancer diagnosis was only due to detection, meaning that we were finding these less than one or two centimeter nodules in cancer. But if you look at the same data set, the cancers above four centimeters were also slightly increasing. And the teaching for many years was mortality wasn't changing, but if you look at a recent publication, as recent as last week from JAMA, that um, evaluated the SEER database from 1974 to 2013, it said that the mortality rate is increasing and the rate of advanced papillary thyroid cancer is increasing, and that's not, and so there's probably a true increase in the incidence, not just a pool of disease that had yet to be discovered that we're finding through all of the imaging that uh, modern medicine exposes us to. So do we know why thyroid nodules and cancer are more common in women? It probably has something to do with the fact that thyroid has estrogen receptors. Mm -hmm. So there's some uh, tendency towards growth. It's about a three to one frequency. Um, you know, your average thyroid 
knowledge going cancer patient is going to be a 45 to 55 year old female. And that's, that's, uh, I see that in, in databases and that's very well reflected in our clinic as well. So I'm sure this is going to vary greatly by subtype, but what's the survival rate for those diagnosed with thyroid cancer? And has it changed much over the years? Good question. So the nice thing is that thyroid cancer is very treatable. So if you look at a five-year survival, it's more than a 98% uh, rate, which is excellent. And unfortunately, then people call it the good cancer, which right, is I've heard that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> totally incorrect. If you are a patient with cancer, the last thing you want to B is dismissed because you have a good cancer, because as we'll talk about, there's a lot of quality of life issues and, and health issues. If, you know, if you've survived your thyroid cancer, you're not the same person. Absolutely. So, so yes, and it does vary by subtypes. So there's three, three main subtypes. Uh, so differentiated thyroid cancer means that the cancer came from the main uh, type of thyroid cell, the follicular uh, thyroid cell. And then you have medullary thyroid cancer, which comes from the parafollicular C cells, and that tends to be more aggressive. And then you have anaplastic thyroid cancer, which is totally disorganized, uh, doesn't represent anything differentiated. And that's a very aggressive uh, cancer where the average survival is only six months. So you're right, survival varies quite a bit. If you look at the more common differentiated thyroid cancers, there's three types, papillary thyroid cancer, which is about 85% of differentiated. And most of those patients present with disease that's confined to the thyroid or minimal uh, involvement of the surrounding lymph nodes. So their 20-year uh, you know, survival is 90 plus percent. They do very well. If you pres it, the patients who get follicular thyroid cancer or herthal thyroid cancer tend to have a higher rate of, of local invasion distant metastasis. And if you present with distant metastasis, your five-year survival is around 50 to 55 percent. Mm -hmm. So it varies by tumor type and also um, stage at initial presentation in terms of survival. And does size play a role in anything like um, survival rate or recurrence of the tumor? Yes. So some people think that you know if a nodule is bigger, it has a higher risk of cancer, and that's really not the case. The reason we base biopsy decisions on size is because if it is a malignancy, size will predict both recurrence and survival. So it usually starts at about two centimeters where you see a... a a difference between survival and recurrence, and then at, at four centimeters, another significant step off, and then at eight centimeters, the recurrence rate's very high and their survival rate uh, is dramatically different from the tumors that are less than two centimeters. So I've really been looking forward to this interview um, because when I was in grad school, I actually had an incidental, incidental nodule finding, um, actually several nodules, and it was based off of a spinal MRI that I had because of a back injury. And so all of a sudden your attention shifts from I have this back injury to wait, I might have cancer is essentially, you know, the way that thought process goes. And so it started off with um, an inconclusive biopsy. And then that transitioned over to them doing a second biopsy, and they diagnosed me with papillary thyroid carcinoma. And then a second opinion came through, and they said, no, it's benign. So I had a third round of um, sampling done, and they said they, they called it um, benign at the end of the day. So I'm really thankful that I didn't have a partial thyroidectomy <laughs> um, because of this, because that's what the direction we were going initially. Um, so how common is that? How common is that? Um, inconclusive finding and, and kind of stumbling along trying to figure out what the sample is. This is a major problem. And you would think when a patient goes through a medical test, they're thinking binary results, yes or no. And that's just not how it works, especially with thyroid nodule biopsies. So you have a lot of variables. You have the one, the selection of a nodule to be biopsied. So we use ultrasound to risk stratify the pattern of the nodule. And so there's five different categories based on what the ultrasound looks like, and that'll predict the probability of cancer. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in patients, you'll have uh, autoimmune thyroid disease, and that might've been the case for you, where you have inflammation, looks like a nodule, biopsies can look suspicious under the microscope to one pathologist, but an experienced pathologist would say, no, this is just atypia due to the inflammatory change, and will reverse a call of papillary thyroid cancer, which is kind of crazy from a standpoint of if you look at the classification rate, if someone calls it positive for malignancy, that's a 99% probability. But if you look at both the disagreement between 
uh, pathologist and what we call the intra-observer variation. So you take the same slides and you show it to the same pathologist a month later, they might change their diagnosis 25, 30% of the time. And pathologists will often disagree with each other 25 to 30% of the time. So it's not unusual to hear these stories of several biopsies and inconclusive or uh, discordant results. And then you have to sit back when you have that data that doesn't make sense and look at the clinical picture, say, what is the patient's risk for thyroid cancer? What does the ultrasound look like? Are there any lymph nodes that are suspicious? Is there any evidence on ultrasound that there's invasion beyond the thyroid? And then make your decision and always involve the patient because usually in young women like your story, you know, this is usually a relatively small nodule. There's no other evidence of disease, but some people can't sleep at night with that question. And oh, some yeah. people are perfectly comfortable saying, I don't want a surgery unless I absolutely have to have it, which sounds like you're in the latter category. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A wise yes. person. <laughs> you know, interestingly, I also had a personal experience with thyroid nodules, which led to surgery and a good outcome thus far. It was uh, early in this experience that I first met you, Dr. Lupo. After hearing you on a podcast in the early days of podcasting, uh, the podcast was called Medical Grand Rounds, and uh, your discussion there was all about fine needle aspiration. And at that point, uh, I knew that I probably needed this particular diagnostic procedure and your interview about the use of very small needles to accomplish the biopsy sounded pretty good to me. <laughs> and you sounded like a thoughtful fellow, so uh, off to Sarasota I went. I recall that first visit, yes, and, <laughs> and that first podcast, because that was a relatively new time in podcast. And so that, you know, your st story um, was somewhat different than Dawn's story um, in that you had symptoms that led you to medical attention. And at first, they didn't think thyroid could possibly have anything to do with it until an astute physician looked at your x-ray and said, wait a minute, something's not right there. <laughs> and so that's how we ended up meeting. And in your case, the ultrasound was indeterminate looking. So we knew there was some abnormal growth there that probably was benign, but hard to tell. The biopsy was also indeterminate, meaning the classification could not be made uh, cancer or not cancer based on the biopsy alone. And, and some, and uh, you and I met right at a time where there was a new commercial availability of genomic testing. And a company in San Francisco called Verisite was studying this gene expression classifier. And the main question they had was, can we identify gene expression that is most consistent with a benign process and then remove from the surgical pool these you know, half of these candidates who have an indeterminate biopsy but have a benign expression? And so we had just finished as one of the collaborators for that study when you came to our office and we had early access to this is that test. And, um, and, and so the rest is history there, but that brings up some of the interesting advances in thyroid nodule evaluation is now we've got second and soon to be third generation molecular testing that if you have nodule biopsies that are indeterminate, which occur up to 20 plus percent of the time, then you can do molecular testing to sort out with a pretty good sense of probability if something is malignant or not. And I think we'll talk about that mm -hmm. more yeah. in the future. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, well, besides Ken, just about every person I know who has undergone a thyroid biopsy originally discovered that they had a thyroid nodule as an incidental finding, just like my situation. So how often are thyroid nodules discovered incidentally? Yeah, our experience, and this is pretty similar to my colleagues who do this, is about 60% or two-thirds is incidental. And it depends. If you're in a cancer center, of course, everyone's being scanned and staged with PET scanning, whole body CTs, et cetera. And so you're going to find a lot of incidental nodules because we talked about the high prevalence of nodules in the general population. So um, probably two-thirds of my patients end up having it incidentally discovered. And about a third, it's either the doctor or the patient will uh, note the nodule. Hmm. Considering that many nodules are uh, incidental lomas found on scans performed for some other indication, as, as you just recounted, has anyone explored the use of computer-assisted diagnosis to determine whether nodules are likely to be malignant or benign? You know, we look at studies that show certain MRI sequences 
can pick up the malignant nodules. And we know that machine learning algorithms, for instance, detect lung cancer on x-ray, uh, in some cases better than trained radiologists can. So uh, I'm kind of wondering whether we could uh, uh, use similar techniques in the context of thyroid, or is there something specific about uh, the imaging methods and thyroid uh, cancer itself that might uh, put this down the road for some time? You're absolutely right. For CT scan use of lung nodules, the algorithms are getting quite good. Uh, for thyroid, though, at least currently what we rely upon the features of uh, subtle cystic change, uh, microcalcification pattern, slight irregular borders cannot easily be appreciated on cross-sectional imaging such as CT scan or MRI. So we rely on ultrasound, which is very user dependent. The technology side of ultrasound is improving and some groups have looked at uh, histograms as well as texture analysis and shear wave elastography to look at the stiffness of a nodule. So I think we'll end up more quantitative in the future at risk stratifying based on ultrasound characteristics. And there's you know, a lot of, some of my colleagues are interested in this specifically, but currently the computer algorithm performance is not better than a skilled physician looking at ultrasound in real time and making a call. But ultrasound, unlike CT, is very user dependent. So going to a place that doesn't do much ultrasound, you're going to get a very different neck and thyroid ultrasound than going to a place where there's a dedication to doing that type of procedure, where CT scan is protocoled and it is fairly uh, um, reproducible. What generated uh, that question partially was a call from a reporter from a large uh, West Coast newspaper who is all at Twitter about the uh, putative hazards of AI. And uh, she had read something about CT scan uh, AI systems doing better than a well-trained radiologist. And she took shock and offense at this idea and thought soon uh, our doctors, our physicians will all be computers. And, uh, it, and she has such an impoverished view of what a physician does that uh, uh, it's like assuming that uh, pilots are diminished by the existence of autopilot. Right. Or right. Uh, mathematicians are diminished by the existence of calculators. Correct. It, yeah. It's a tool to help the physician, not to replace the physician. Right. And we are relying much more on technology, but unless you have an interface with, with the human, it doesn't work very well. Right. Right. So on that note, are there certain characteristics that you can see by ultrasound when you conduct FNA that gives you an idea if you're looking at a benign or malignant nodule? Definitely. So my, so my approach is to do ultrasound myself, so I don't have a technician or a sonographer doing it. So I can do real-time ultrasound, and which is much better than looking at static images mm -hmm. because some of the echoes that we see on a still shot it's hard to tell if it's a microcalcification, which is associated with a high risk of cancer, or reflection from a cystic per, uh, component of the nodule, or something called a comet tail, which is in a benign colloid nodule. So there are certain features that we depend on to risk stratify, and there are certain classic high-risk profiles of calcification, irregular borders, lymph node abnormalities, and it's very important if you have a thyroid nodule to make sure someone's looking at the surrounding lymph nodes, which is often not done because that is integrated into the risk stratification. For the biopsy part, you know, I, I interestingly biopsy a lot less nodules than I used to. I still see the same number of patients, but now I've gotten so comfortable with the pattern recognition that I realize this is going to be a benign biopsy. I don't even need to do it. So I'm biopsying you know, more nodules that end up being intermediate or suspicious. And one thing you know, we would talk about during the FNA. So if you're, if you're in a solid nodule and, and you have resistance, you know, so that concept of elastography, meaning how stiff is that nodule with the idea that stiffer nodules have higher risk of malignancy, you know, the needle is a great way to detect that because if you put the needle in and it's a lot of resistance and it's not because of calcification, that's going to be a tumor. Yeah. So then I look at it under the microscope while the patient's still there. Firstly, to make sure I have enough of a sample for the pathologist because there's a fairly high 
inadequacy rate, which means the biopsy is done, it's looked at the next day, they realize, oh, about 10 to 15% of the time didn't get enough. So we look at it, but also look at the pattern, and I try to match up what I'm seeing under the microscope. Is it correlate with what I'm seeing on ultrasound? And if it correlates, then I know I've done my job. Let's see what the pathologist thinks. And so what are the histological differences between a benign adenoma and a malignant nodule? Now, I know know there are different subtypes that we're going to talk about, but what would you be looking for to say yes or no um, between benign and malignant? Right. So, you know, the the, the tricky part is the non-classic papillary. So the classic papillary cancers, which end up being the majority of our cancers, will have a typical ultrasound suspicious appearance and typical appearance under the microscope that you know you're dealing with a probable papillary cancer. The problem is these neoplastic or tumor growth. So when we say tumor in medicine, we're not always thinking cancer, which is what the public perception is. A tumor to me can be benign tumor or a malignant tumor. So you'll have these follicular neoplasm as a very legitimate result after a biopsy. And we tell the patient there's about 20% chance of cancer And short of doing some of the molecular testing, really the gold standard is surgery to determine if the capsule of that tumor has been invaded by tumor or if there's blood vessel invasion. So the key question of adenoma versus malignancy is made on the surgical specimen by the pathologist to document an either capsular or vascular invasion, if I understood your question correctly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, back to uh, the topic we were discussing earlier about indeterminate uh, diagnosis. You know, I understand that more and more of the biopsies are being read as, in fact, being in one of the uh, indeterminate categories that we see specified in the relatively new Bethesda classifications. And then this then, not surprisingly, leads to more surgeries. And uh, it seems this seems this uh, increased classification of indeterminate seems like perhaps a natural but unfortunate, uh, uh, let's call it a CYA response by cytopathologists when they see something like Herthel cells, just call it indeterminate and you can't be wrong. Now, that might be a little unfair, um, but before the new nomenclature, I understand roughly 9% of thyroid nodules were going to surgery, and now it's something like 37% of the patients go to surgery. Can you uh, discuss this phenomena a little bit and help us understand it better? Yeah, this is a complicated question, and the 9 and 37% really is going to be institution-based, so I'm sure that is one institution's experience, but What I saw happen when the Bethesda system was introduced is there was a new class that was atypia and that was supposed to have a 5 to 15% risk of malignancy, which I think was gave the open door to pathologists who weren't very comfortable with thyroid cytopathology to say, I something about it looks makes me worry a little bit. I would have called this benign, but now that I have this atypia category, let me throw it in here just as a potential CYA. So this is where you want to use pathologists who are really accustomed to seeing high volumes of thyroid uh, FNAs so they can make these determinations and provide adequate clinical information. Because if you have a person with autoimmune thyroid disease, a biopsy will show Herthel cells. But in the context of background inflammatory lymphocytes and a diagnosis of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, the pathologist can comfortably say those are benign Herthel cells, where a lack of communication or a pathologist who's not reading these as often will call that atypical or potentially indeterminate. So you've increased the pool of potential indeterminate biopsies just by adding uh, more categories. I mean, and we see the same thing in thyroid nodule classifications. I like the three-tiered system of low, medium, high risk, because between observers, you'll have a huge variability if you have a five-tiered system versus a three-tiered system. So this is the same problem with the Bethesda. You add a different class, and now suddenly you're using these in the middle classes that increase the call rate of indeterminates. Now, the flip side, so if you apply that to the general public doing biopsies, Um, your indeterminate rate goes up because more biopsies are being done. Maybe they're read not necessarily by experts. So if we look at a thyroid uh, specialty center, 
uh, like ours, I see a higher rate of indeterminance because I'm not biopsying the nodules that look benign. Mm -hmm. So I'm only biopsying ones that look like they're have something neoplastic about them or something potentially you know suspicious about them. So our indeterminate rate in turn goes up mm -hmm. because we're not biopsying all the nodules that other people are biopsying. Yeah, you've selected those we've out. Pre-selected, it, right. It's interesting in that a very experienced place would likely see an elevated rate of indeterminate as would a very inexperienced place. Correct. Yeah, for different reasons. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's very interesting. And uh you know, you can see uh, there's a big literature in the social sciences that would predict uh, a low confidence in a categorization system with a larger range in scales than three. You know, when you get to seven, it's really difficult. And 26, it's impossible. Yeah. Right. So uh, in a way, it's not surprising, but it's certainly very interesting. It's a nice combination of science and human behavior. So could you elaborate on how genetic testing and molecular profiling of thyroid cytology specimens guide the appropriate management of these indeterminate nodules? So, you know, you get someone and it looks indeterminate. Well, what next? Right. So the first thing we do is think as a clinician before we start applying more technology, which inherently has a high cost. So the clinician says, does this patient have a personal risk for thyroid cancer? Are there uh, symptoms uh, that are compressive symptoms? Is there something about the ultrasound that looks higher risk? And usually we've done a biopsy on one nodule on one side. And the question is, do we need to remove it or not if it's indeterminate? So if there's compressive symptoms, nodules on both sides, lymph nodes that look suspicious, then I don't need molecular testing to tell me this person needs some surgery. But if there's doubt, then there's kind of a, a fork in the road because if I think clinically this looks low risk, but I am stuck with an indeterminate, then I want to test that has a high negative predictive value. So I want to test that historically has been like the Affirma test that its mission was to do this uh, um, genomic expression and classify benign versus uh, suspicious. So if they have a benign call rate, which ends up being about 40 to 50% of indeterminate nodules using that technology are called benign. So then there's a 95% probability that it's benign, similar to a benign biopsy, so we're comfortable following them. The problem with that technology is it's positive predictive value, meaning if the test says suspicious, what's the likelihood of cancer is about 40%. So if it's suspicious, the patient goes to surgery, over half the time, it's still benign. That is because it's specificity is low. So specificity means you know absence in health, and uh, so you have a unfortunately a, a false positive in that case. So then, if I have nodules that I think might be worrisome for cancer, but no other clinical features that would guide me towards an automatic total thyroidectomy, then I'm looking for mutations that are associated with a high probability of cancer. So we see. Um, different types of mutations, and we could talk about those now or later, but if you have a mutation that is associated with a high probability of cancer, then you might elect a total thyroidectomy depending on the size, but even those guidelines have evolved to where a lot of patients with low-risk thyroid cancer are very well served with a lobectomy. So that's gotten even more complicated to select that out, but some of the second and third generation of the um, uh, of the mutational testing, so looking at gene mutations and transformations, uh, and that's mostly done by Dr. Yuri Nikiforov at the University of Pittsburgh, um, has been able to give us a high specificity and a high sensitivity, so both the negative and positive predictive value are very high. So if that's validated, then that would be an ideal test to make a definite diagnosis of of a nodule that needs surgery. And then depending on what type of mutation it has, some, you know, these driver mutations and combinations of mutations potentially impart a higher risk of aggressive behavior, then you are, are more comfortable with more aggressive surgery. That's the future. That needs to be really vetted out. But I think that's, you know, as we get more mutation specific, we'll be better at making decisions uh, therapeutically on that. So right now we can probably pull at least half the people out of that surgical pool just by doing molecular testing if clinically we don't already know what to do. 
So which institutions are doing these specialized tests um, now at, at this point? Right. So the your University of Pittsburgh Medical Center mm-hmm. is doing it. Um, and then uh, the other are our private companies. So some most universities have some um, ability to test BRAF and RAS and like a limited seven gene panel. But the uh, University of Pittsburgh has the 14 gene panel plus the translocations and and uh, it's uh, very much more robust at this point. And they're adding uh, different uh, markers to further um, deal with, especially the Herthel cell uh, neoplasms that are hard to, to, to diagnose pre-surgically. Um, so the University of Pittsburgh, and then privately the Verisite company with their Affirma test. And then there's a company called Rosetta Genomics um, that, Interestingly, so most of these are done just on the needle biopsy, but this company takes the slide that the pathologist was interested in, saying this is the part that's really indeterminate. They scrape it and they do microRNA um, expression classification on it. And so that um, you know, one, the initial validation study looks good, uh, working on you know, more validation. And that's a neat way of having a patient who's already had a biopsy who didn't have at the time biopsy for molecular testing, just use the material you already have. And from a pathology standpoint, you're looking at the exact uh, cells that you're concerned about. So you're not worried about a sampling error where, where where did that needle go when you were getting the sample for the other type of testing? So I, I think that that will be an interesting addition to, to the uh, molecular testing. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. Okay, so you're talking about these different molecular subtypes. Can you go into a little more description of what we're looking at yeah. when we're doing some of this molecular so testing? We, we try to keep it relatively simple. So if you have a, you know, a follicular type tumor, so a, a, a follicular cell origin, so you know, so you can have a TSH receptor mutation. So the TSH receptor mutation usually is in a toxic thyroid nodule, so one that's autonomous. They make extra thyroid hormone because they don't pay attention to the normal feedback from the pituitary, but they're almost invariably benign. So if I have a nodule that's indeterminate on cytology but has a TSH receptor mutation, I'm going to follow that patient for developing overactive thyroid in the future. I'm not worried about thyroid cancer. Mm-hmm. Then you have the RAS-like mutations. So RAS mutations is probably the most one of the most common ones we see for follicular adenomas, follicular thyroid cancer, and the follicular variant papillary thyroid cancer, and now this new uh, tumor type called Nifty P that we'll talk about later. Um, so these are all tumors that are RAS driven and typically very low risk tumors that do need resection, but have a you know, very good cure rate with resection until you get additional driver mutations like TERT or P53 or other things on top of that. So once you start adding those mutations to those RAS mutations, then that increases risk quite a bit. Um, if you're looking at the BRAF mutation, so BRAF or BRAF-like, uh, the main one we see, just like we see in melanoma, is the V600E mutation, which is present in you know, probably half of papillary thyroid cancer, depending on the population of papillary thyroid cancer, depending on the population you're looking at. Um, and then, so that's one we can use you know, diagnostically on a biopsy specimen. It was used to be the thought that that independently imparts a higher aggressive behavior to the cancer, but it, that didn't pan out as well. But we are seeing that if you add a TERP mutation to a BRAF, then the uh, risk uh, is much higher. Uh, the mortality and both recurrence rate uh, is much higher as well. So um, the, those are the main ones we're looking at. And it's interesting because uh, the science is outpacing guidelines because guidelines right now say, don't use any of this for prognostic or therapeutic. But I mean, the next set of guidelines is probably going to include just that. Absolutely. I was going to ask if there are are targeted therapeutics right now for some of those mutations. Not yet FDA available, but there's going to be some uh, BRAF inhibitors uh, that are are currently used for other tumor types that are going to be used for for these mutations and um, targeted therapy to, as we talk about radioactive iodine, to 
reverse the iodine resistance, the radioactive iodine resistance, and help that uh, the tumor take up iodine for therapy. So there's going to be some very specific targeted therapies for the mutation profile you know, based on that tumor biology. So the future is, is exciting. It's very exciting to start talking about precision medicine. So is there a genetic predisposition to any types of thyroid cancer? Yeah. So, you know, the classic that we think about for thyroid cancer is medullary thyroid cancer. So that's only about 2 to 3% of the thyroid cancers we see. But there's a high rate of familial medullary thyroid cancer or multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes, 2A and 2B. Um, and that's uh, where we see our medullary thyroid cancer. So the genetics of that are, are, are very interesting, and about 25% of our medullary patients have some sort of inheritance in that regard. For the non-medullary familial thyroid cancer syndrome, so looking at papillary follicular, um, probably only 5 to 10% of all of our patients, so most of it's sporadic. But if we you know, drill down to, well, who gets these familial syndromes? It's the people with Calden syndrome or the P10 mutation, or patients with familial adenomatous polyposis. And so those are patients when that family history presents, you screen them differently, your threshold for biopsy is different. Um, and, and the reverse side, you wanna make sure if you're seeing someone for a thyroid nodule or cancer who has a personal history of a breast cancer, you start thinking, could this be a Cowden uh, P10 type situation? So reminding the clinicians and patients to be aware of, of personal and family history and, and thought process mm -hmm. during the workup. So, you know, we've talked about fine needle aspiration or FNA, as we've been calling it in the interview earlier. Um, follicular carcinoma and herthal cell carcinoma cannot be diagnosed by FNA biopsy. As a result, these patients often end up needing a formal surgical biopsy, which usually entails removal of the thyroid lobe that harbors the nodule. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the situation? So herthal cell tumors are a subtype of the follicular tumors, and herthal cells can exist in very normal thyroid, but the presence of a Herthal cell in a biopsy makes pathologists and clinicians sometimes nervous. You have to look and see if the patient has Hashimoto's, if there's background lymphocytic thyroiditis because of that autoimmune attack. And the you know, if you have a true Herthal neoplasm, then the risk of malignancy is probably about 15 or 20%. And the diagnosis is made on a surgical specimen. The molecular testing is not yet reliable enough for me to observe a Herthal tumor, especially if it's above two centimeters, because as we talked about, size is important in terms of the predisposition or the tendency towards metastasis in larger tumors, and that usually starts above two centimeters. If I have a Herthal nodule above two centimeters on biopsy, that's going to be removed, and the diagnosis is made by the pathologist looking at vascular invasion, and they will count the number of sites of angioinvasion. If there's any angioinvasion, then you call it at least a minimally invasive herthal cancer. If there's more than four, then that's considered a uh, widely inv angioinvasive and a higher risk for metastasis. So it's interesting that right from that initial surgical pathology, we can risk stratify you know, the patient's behavior and future behavior in terms of distant METs. The other thing we look for is invasion of the tumor capsule. So minimal invasion, invasion you know, beyond the tumor capsule into the surrounding thyroid, et cetera. So that diagnosis for Herthal is typically made surgically and not as reliably through molecular testing. Mm -hmm. Great. As mentioned uh, during the Colin Champ and Dominic Diagostino interviews here on STEM Talk, effective uh, ketogenic dieting uh, limits glucose availability and uh, suppresses insulin signaling. And uh, it's well known that both of these dramatically increase PET. We were talking about PET earlier, uh, positron emission tomography intensity and uh, thereby likely contribute to growth and proliferation of cancer cells. And I'm wondering, since PET has been shown to be helpful in diagnosing metastatic disease in Herthal cell carcinomas, particularly with tumors that have low iodine avidity, uh, there was a study by Prima, uh, PET was shown to increase diagnostic accuracy over CT and over radioactive iodine scan. In addition, this study uh, showed intense 18F FTG uptake, essentially glucose, in lesions was a strong indicator of a poor prognosis. One wonders whether in instances like this, it might make sense to use a ketogenic diet or exogenous ketones 
as part of a supplemental multimodal approach to managing this cancer? Or is it is it not the case in uh, a HERTHA cell thyroid cancer? Good question. So the HERTHA cell cancers, the HERTHA cell neoplasms are mitochondrial rich. So their glucose utilization is intense. So if we look at this Warburg effect of cancer cells you know, anaerobically metabolizing glucose, there's a lot of interest in other cancer types of decreasing the uh, glucose exposure to the host, uh, the person, the patient, and uh, decreasing the insulin levels. And so the amount of insulin resistance we see in the country is tremendous. And I think that has something to do with increased cancer incidence. So I generally, while there's increasing data for you know, low carbohydrate or even potentially ketogenic diets for other cancer types, there's nothing specific yet for thyroid. I like the concept though, if I have patients with a metabolic syndrome phenotype of insulin resistance and they have an aggressive or advanced thyroid cancer, I do put them on low carbohydrate diets and I put some of them on metformin for this very reason. So I like the concept. The Herthel cell um, cancer is a good example of one where we see that inverse relationship between I-131 avidity and PET FDG avidity. So the Herthel cells tend not to res tend not to have as uh, effective of a sodium iodine symporter, and so they don't take up the iodine as well because we um, exploit this dif the differentiation of thyroid cancer by using radioactive iodine to treat thyroid cancer and for diagnostic use, and we exploit the production of thyroglobulin by a normal differentiated thyroid cancer to use as a tumor marker, which we'll talk about later. So these Herthel cells tend not to do that as well, especially with the iodine um, uptake. So the FDG uptake, one, for thyroid cancers in general, the more uptake there is on PET scan, the more aggressive they tend to be. And specifically for Herthel cells, the guidelines are clear that PET scan is an important part of the staging where it's not... Um, advocated as much for uh, papillary thyroid cancer or follicular, and it's actually not a good tool for medullary. So it's not a very sensitive for medullary. So often people think a PET scan is the gold standard for thyroid, or excuse me, for cancer screening. It really depends on what cancer you're looking for. But Herthel is a great one if you're looking at staging uh, for, with PET scan. Yeah, it, it, given all that you said, is it's sort of what made me wonder if Hertha cells might be one of the few or maybe the only thyroid cancer where my question made a lot of sense, given right. the- I think it would be the best yeah. uh, candidate for that, right. but yeah. So what are your thoughts on the current interest in understanding that cancer is at least partially a metabolic disorder? There's lots of models where, you know, especially insulin as a growth factor is an issue for thyroid cancer, for, for cancers in general. So, so I think of uh, the metabolic um, treatment for, for cancers, it makes sense to look at nutritional changes and, and uh, decreasing insulin levels, uh, either pharmacologically or dietary. And I think we need more information, but it, it's reassuring as an endocrinologist, you know, specializing in metabolism before I put my thyroid hat more on squarely and left the metabolism side of endocrine more behind that, that, you know, when you look at cancer biology, that, um, in addition to immunology, metabolism is a key part of the treatment. So I think so. I'm not sure if I answered your question. So I'm interested in it, but I, yeah. So we've talked a lot about diagnosis. So talk about the different treatment options for thyroid cancer. It's a lot more complicated than it used to be. <laughs> if I were here seven, eight years ago, I would say every diagnosed thyroid cancer needs at least a lobectomy and anything above one centimeter would need a total thyroidectomy. So we really simplified it. Now we're realizing, well, let's let the punishment fit the crime. So if you have this huge pool in the population of thyroid microcancers, papillary microcancers, most of these probably can be safely observed if they're less than one centimeter. Yeah, there are exceptions, of course. And when we get these patients with six, seven millimeter uh, papillary thyroid cancers and second opinion saying, should I have surgery? If it's completely surrounded by normal thyroid tissue, if there's no abnormal lymph nodes, if it's not a multifocal situation, um, if it's not right up against the capsule of the thyroid or the esophagus uh, on ultrasound, then we could probably observe them. And if you look at the Japanese data on observing this over 15 years, the minority of them 
changed. And even if these patients had a lymph node development, they were treated very effectively with surgery at that time as effectively as they would have been if they had surgery at initial diagnosis. So our ability now to offer active surveillance. So it's not a watch and wait. It's now we call it active surveillance for these low risk, but very common cancers is, is a viable option for patients, but has to be done in a center that knows what to look for and with the right patient, because psychologically it could be problematic if a patient knows he or she has a diagnosis of cancer and we're just quote watching, we're not doing something. So you know, we have a lot to learn with that paradigm. The other thing that's changed is if you look at tumors between one and four centimeters in the absence of lymph nodes or other high risk features, it's perfectly reasonable based on large surgical series to offer a lobectomy as opposed to total thyroidectomy. Mm -hmm. And that's a big change. It makes a lot of clinicians uncomfortable because then they figure, well, I can't use my tumor marker as well because our tumor marker is a thyroid protein called thyroglobulin that's not specific to cancer. So if you have a whole intact lobe, that's gonna make thyroglobulin. But if you recognize you're looking for the trend in thyroglobulin and you can use ultrasound to see if anything's changing, it's actually quite nice because from a wellness and quality of life standpoint, if that patient has an intact lobe, they may not need any thyroid hormone replacement or a small dose and their quality of life in my experience is much better. So I'm very happy that we have the ability to comfortably offer lobectomies for low risk situations. Um, but that's not the case for all cancers. And again, it's, it's the thyroid cancers can be intermediate or high risk. And if you see you know, bilateral disease, extension beyond the thyroid, lymph nodes, you know, then you need at least a total thyroidectomy, but importantly, you need an expert thyroid surgeon. You need someone who does at least 30 of these a year because the complication rate is directly proportioned to how many you do. And unfortunately, about 80% of the surgeries are done by surgeons who do less than 10 a year in this country. So multiple papers looking at this, and I'm always surprised because the surgeon I work with does 150 a year. And so I think these you know, people who don't have access to high volume thyroid surgeons have a higher complication rate of uh, vocal cord paralysis or damage to the parathyroid gland. So their calcium level is always low. So quality of life can be significantly impacted in these patients. So the surgical decision is is complicated. You need good pre-op imaging, which means you have to look for lymph nodes with ultrasound and or CT scan, but at least ultrasound. Um, and you have to have a good surgeon if you have more extensive, it, you know, with any disease, but especially with more extensive disease because the patients with extensive lymph node involvement, which could be one in seven, one in 10 patients, a average surgeon may miss some of those lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. So then you're gonna get persistence disease that you have to deal with down the road. So surgery is the single most important part of thyroid cancer treatment. So I can't, under, I can't overemphasize that. So the second part is um, the question of thyroid hormone suppression of TSH. So TSH comes from the pituitary, it's thyroid stimulating hormone. And naturally, if you've got cancer cells, you don't wanna stimulate them. So you wanna keep this thyroid stimulating hormone level low. And we do that by giving you know, moderate to high doses of levothyroxine, which is a bioidentical synthetic copy of thyroxine that your thyroid used to make, but now you have no thyroid. So you have to give it to the patient anyway. So you give it at doses that keeps that TSH either low normal or slightly low, depending on the risk of recurrence. So higher risk patients get TSHs that are sometimes even undetectable. Uh, we've backed off a little bit, but it's very important if t for the patient to know what their TSH goal is because sometimes the primary physician's taking care of the thyroid hormone replacement and doesn't know what the TSH goal is. So it's important that you discuss the risk of recurrence with the patient and then assign a TSH goal that's tolerable. If you overdo it for patients with osteoporosis or heart disease, you can worsen those situations. So you have to be Indi you have to individualize this decision with patients based on their tumor risk and their ability to tolerate the TSH suppression. Mm -hmm. So TSH suppression is systemic therapy for these thyroid cancer patients. Very important, often you know, under-emphasized. The next question is, does the patient need radioactive iodine? So if we um, look at l exploiting the fact that differentiated thyroid cells, which is our, most of these cancers, will take up iodine, then we can use radioactive iodine to treat them and, and kill them. So most of the time these days, we 
don't need radioactive iodine, but in the past, the standard of care was total thyroidectomy and radioactive iodine. So we've learned two things in the last five years where the current guidelines are very different than the 2009 guidelines. Number one, most of our low and well, probably all of our low and most of our intermediate risk patients may not benefit from radioactive iodine. Number two, if we elect to give radioactive iodine for what we call remnant ablation, meaning we always leave a little bit of thyroid tissue behind, but we want to knock that out, either because there's something that makes us feel there's a little risk um, above average, or we want to simplify the surveillance by cleaning the slate of thyroglobulin, which is a thyroid protein, then we can give a remnant ablation, which we used to do with 100 millicuries of I-131, and we've learn from two very well-designed large studies that for low and intermediate risk patients, 30 millicuries works as well. Mm -hmm. so, so we're using it less in general and we're using lower doses, which is good, but there's also radioactive iodine that's adjuvant. Adjuvant means that there's probably some disease left in the neck and we hope we can you know, improve that with the radioactive iodine or uh, treatment. So treatment means that there's distant metastasis that's our iodine avid uh, that we can treat with radioactive iodine. And about two thirds of patients who initially have distant METs will take up iodine, but that doesn't mean it's always going to work. Sometimes you'll take up iodine and have a partial response. Sometimes you'll take up iodine initially, but then on subsequent treatment efforts, you don't take up the iodine. So it's because it works so well in iodine avid disease, it's the first line to try in especially high risk patients, even with, with distant METs, is even with Herthel cells, you give them a dose of radioactive iodine to see what happens because they'll sometimes take up the iodine and have at least a partial response. Mm -hmm. So that's the next question in the treatment is iodine. But then you get to a point where radioactive iodine doesn't work so well. Surgery doesn't seem very safe or likely effective. So then you can do localized therapies. Most of the neck disease is dealt with with, sur with more surgery. But once you are talking about lung or bone disease, you can, have, you can treat with radiation, you can treat with uh, um, uh, radiofrequency ablation, you can treat uh, uh, with resection, potentially even lung. But sometimes you get to a point where you can't, uh, where it's diffuse lung disease or multiple lung nodules, multiple bone mets, occasionally liver and brain mets, Again, this is very uncommon, less than 5% of all of our patients with thyroid cancer, but these are the ones that you have to then think like an oncologist. Mm -hmm. So the oncologist is looking at systemic therapy that's chemotherapy, and in the for thyroid currently, we look at targeted therapy with uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So you then um, look at the biology of the tumor, look at the the fact that you know, two main targets, one would be the, the vascular endothelial cell because these tumors have capillaries, they need vascular uh, um, support to grow. So if you can uh, use VEGF inhibitors, so vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors, which uh, most of these multi-kinase inhibitors are VEGF inhibitors as well, you decrease blood supply, which makes a lot of sense. Then if you look at the pathways of um, tumor genesis, um, on the, end of, on, on the epithelial cell of the thyroid, um, you can block the different kinase receptors to kind of slow the pathway down, and you can block um, at, at different areas like BRAF, et cetera. So there's two approved kinase inhibitors for differentiated thyroid cancer, linbatinib and serafinib, and then there's um, two also for medullary, but that's less common. So the, the ones that we use for differentiated they slow progression. So by progression in oncology, we mean that we can see radiographic evidence of tumor growth. And um, so if you can slow that down, that's good, but neither one of them has proven any overall survival yet, which is what patients wanna know is I'm gonna live longer. You think maybe because the problem with the studies is it's crossover study design where you have placebo versus drug. And as soon as the placebo progresses, you put them on drug. So it's really hard to gauge overall survival, even though we hope that's gonna be the case. So finally, just in the last three years, we've had an option to treat radioactive iodine refractory thyroid cancer with oral chemotherapy. And as an endocrinologist, I do that in conjunction with my medical oncology colleagues. So we team up on this. But luckily, that's still a very small minority of thyroid cancer patients. So while we have better options for this small group with advanced cancer that we have to recognize and treat when the timing is right, we're backing off where less is more for the average thyroid cancer patient.
That was a fantastic answer. So, um, so what about immunotherapy? Can you describe this treatment modality in general terms and then more specifically as it relates to thyroid cancer? Yes. So immunotherapy is fascinating to me. So there's different types of immunotherapy. You can have a vaccine that delivers therapy. You can have a, you know, a monoclonal antibody that, that attacks a certain part of a cell. The new kind of sexy uh, checkpoint inhibitors are quite interesting where you know, the idea would be that for a normal cell, we don't want the immune system to attack it. So you have a certain signaling that occurs so that the immune system doesn't attack the cell. We would want the immune system to attack a cancer cell, but sometimes the cancer cells are not recognized by the immune system as foreign, or the cancer cell will actually release something that tricks the immune system into thinking you're okay, you've passed your checkpoint, and you can you know, move on and attack someone else. So these checkpoint inhibitors, like the PD-1 and PDL one inhibitors, um, will essentially take the brakes off the immune system. So these checkpoints then don't exist, so the immune system will attack the cancer cell, which is a great concept and has worked very well in a lot of cancers, but at the expense of normal cells. And from a, as a, so we don't use these for thyroid cancer, but as a thyroid uh, expert, I see the thyroid autoimmune disease because of these checkpoint inhibitors. Yeah. Yeah. You see the uh, effects. I see the effects of yeah. the treatment. Right. <laughs> so I don't use them for thyroid cancer. I just see the downstream effects of when the immune system starts attacking things and the thyroid is a common victim. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you've talked about thyroid cancer metastasizing. I would imagine that this varies by subtype. Yes. So if we look at um, papillary thyroid cancer, relatively low rate of metastasis, but most of your patients with metastatic thyroid cancer have papillary thyroid cancer because it's the most common, right? So, but if you think about anaplastic thyroid cancer at the other end, it's, it's amazing that one gland can give two opposite spect ends of the spectrum of a, hum of a human cancer experience. So you have these low risk pathway thyroid cancers that most people are very well treated with either observation or minimal surgery. At the other end of the spectrum, one of the worst cancers that humans get, anaplastic thyroid cancer, which is practically a death sentence with most people um, passing within six months with a very aggressive me metastatic uh, local invasion and distant metastasis. So in between you have medullaries, which tend to metastasize more than herthals, which tend to metastasize more than follicular. So it depends on subtype. So how might lifestyle and environmental exposures be impacting the prevalence of thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer? Yeah, so we're clearly seeing an increase in both, and, and it's a tough question. So if we think of the most common radiation, so ionizing radiation has been associated with an increased risk of both nodules and cancer. And you know, in the 19, between 1910 and 1960, we were pretty cavalier about using radiation to treat all sorts of things, you know, thymus enlargement, tonsil enlargement, mm -hmm. acne, uh, so a lot of people as a child were exposed to ionizing radiation to the neck, which inc increased these risks. So we're seeing, you know, those people now are running their course because we stopped that 50 years, 50, 60 years ago. Um, if you look at other uh, sources of ionizing radiation, like the Chernobyl accident in 86 and the, the atomic bombs in 45, you definitely see, of the, especially the children exposed, in particular in iodine deficient areas, a high uh, spike in the cancer risk. So we know ionizing radiation is an issue. And if you look at the mid-century tests, Nevada test sites, and the fallout in the iodine, I-131 exposure in people, that certainly might play a role as well. But interestingly, if you look at the um, genetics mutations associated with ionizing radiation, which is the um, RET-PTC um, uh, translocation, if you start testing tumors for that over the year, the frequency of that is decreasing, whereas the frequency of BRAF and RAS mutations are increasing. Mm -hmm. So the mutations that we would think, if all of this increase in incidence was due to radiation, you would think that the the mutation that we see with radiation would be increased, but it's not. It's actually decreasing. So radiation probably played a role and maybe playing less a role. So then smoking. Well, smoking is just bad in every way. From a standpoint of nodules, we see more nodules in smokers, mm -hmm. but not necessarily more cancer in smokers. Looking at other lifestyle issues, the way we eat and the way we don't exercise is increasing obesity, insulin resistance. And as we talked about that, probably has an impact on 
many types of cancer. And I wouldn't be surprised if part of what we're seeing with thyroid cancer is insulin resistance that's uh, extremely prevalent in this country and, and other uh, parts of the world. Um, looking at environmental endocrine disruptors like the um, BPA and uh, perchlorates and things like that, we do see a problem with hormone regulation, but not yet cancers. Mm -hmm. But there's probably something environmental that's uh, causing, uh, uh, or at least impacting in part, the increased risk of cancer. We just don't know enough yet yeah. about that. I remember when I had my nodule, the thyroid nodule issue, um, and once it was all kind of resolved, they thought that maybe it was my soy intake um, because I'm vegetarian and I was drinking a lot of soy at the time and taking a lot of soy, and they thought that that might have led to the development of thyroid nodules. Yeah, soy can have an effect um, to slow thyroid function and potentially make thyroid growth occur, both nodular and general diffuse enlargement. More common in people with autoimmune thyroid disease, even if it wasn't recognized. I mean, half the people with autoimmune thyroid disease don't test uh, abnormal on screening tests for thyroid. So, you know, when people talk about different dietary changes for thyroid health, it, most of us with normal thyroids can get away with eating pretty much anything we want from a thyroid, you know, function standpoint. But people with subclinical or, or undetected autoimmune thyroid disease are sensitive to too much iodine, probably too much soy, you know, things like that. So that can be a problem. Interesting. What about dental x-rays? Overused? No. Um, <laughs> so yes. Yeah. So the dentists like their x-rays. And they um, you know, they do offer thyroid shields and I think people should use them. There's no benefit whatsoever to getting uh, uh, you know, radiation to your thyroid. So they don't all offer thyroid shields. And the American Thyroid Association had an initiative to you know, put their logo on these dental you know, uh, x-ray thyroid shields so we can make awareness uh, or increase awareness. And same with mammography. We we're thinking you know, maybe we should shield the thyroid for that. And there's no benefit to radiation to the thyroid. But if you look at the real risk of ionizing radiation to thyroid, it's mostly in children and adolescents. At least that's what we've, what we've historically thought. And there are people who have occupational radiation exposure, like radiologists or et cetera, you know, even pilots, sure. um, who I see more in the practice than, than not. I mean, maybe it's a selection bias that I'm seeing, but there's probably a plausible uh, cause and effect with occupational radiation, which we get usually during adulthood and not childhood. So I think if, to minimize radiation in general is good. If we look at the amount of CT scanning used in this country and some of the other uh, scan happy countries. No, but some of the other countries that like to, you know, they're heavy in imaging, we're getting a lot of radiation uh, and there's protocols now specifically to reduce the amount of radiation. So there's awareness of this, um, but, and hopefully it'll, it'll help, but it'll take a long time to sort out if, if changes in radiation exposure make a difference in thyroid cancer incidents in 20, 30 years down the road. Yeah, it's a great answer. It, it makes no sense not to use the thyroid shield, though, when you go Correct. into get, I you know, I, my last one was like, well, we don't know where it is, you know, uh, I saw it around here somewhere. <laughs> right. And I said, well, we're not doing this until you find it. Yeah, guess what? That's right. <laughs> so, Mark, what, if any, prophylactic measures can we take to minimize our own risk of developing thyroid nodules or cancer? Yeah, I think as we've talked about, insulin resistance is associated with both thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. So while I don't you know, support any one specific diet, a guiding principle would be to eat a lower carbohydrate, lower sugar diet to try to decrease your insulin levels because that can cause growth for both nodules and cancer. There's a lot of over-marketed diet uh, approaches, you know, thyroid diets, et cetera, that I don't think are, are really vetted in the literature enough to support them. Um, for autoimmune thyroid disease, kind of separate from the nodule and cancer question, I have a low threshold to recommend a gluten-free diet. Um, there's no study that says that Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is the most common autoimmune thyroid disease we see, requires a gluten-free diet, nor does it lower thyroid antibody levels, but some people just feel better and do better. So maybe it's a self-fulfilling prophecy if they're following some sort of diet, which uh, you know, decreases sugar and carbohydrate intake in most cases. Mm -hmm. So you've noted that insulin resistance is correlated with and perhaps even causally related to the development of nodules. And, you know, frankly, insulin resistance seems connected to just so many diseases and chronic conditions in today's world. Uh, it's not surprising, but it's, it, it remains remarkable. In fact, insulin level and percentage body fat seem to be um, very 
excellent top-level predictors of a person's health. Uh, what, what do you think, Dr. Lupo? Absolutely. I trained in endocrinology in the land of insulin resistance in San Diego. So that was before, as I was thinking about doing more thyroid and planning to do more thyroid, I got my roots in doing insulin glucose clamps and muscle biopsies. So I can recognize an insulin resistant patient from across the hall or across the street. So, but that's not commonly recognized in medicine. I think we need to have more awareness because as you said, there's so many diseases. People just think diabetes, but that's just the tip of the iceberg for patients with insulin resistance, with cardiovascular disease, you know, chronic inflammation, uh, musculoskeletal disease, nerve dysfunction, et cetera, and just overall performance, uh, cognitive and risk for neoplastic or, or cancer uh, disorder. So I think we need to do a lot better as physicians recognizing and counseling patients on insulin resistance. And uh, you know, just walking through the malls or the airports, you should point out that almost half the population has you know, that central uh, obesity or you know, abdominal weight that's classic for that phenotype of insulin resistance. And Milan's airport uh, is different in that respect than Dubai's airport. <laughs> yeah, correct. Right. Yes. <laughs> so, Mark, I want to talk to you about a recommendation for screening individuals for thyroid cancer. I'm thinking that if roughly 50% of the population has thyroid nodules, and if this population is screened for nodules and cancer, that a policy to screen for these things would lead to many unnecessary biopsies, the discovery of many small carcinomas, and also greatly elevated stress and duress for many patients. So what's your thought as far as screening for thyroid cancer and thyroid nodules? Don't do it. Okay, right. So screening for thyroid would be a nightmare epidemiologically because you're finding half of people would have a nodule and then that's going to, even if it doesn't result in a biopsy, that's going to result in multiple follow-up ultrasound studies uh, anxiety on the patient's part, cost to the system. But in this day and age where people like to do biopsies, if anything, the idea of risk stratification based on ultrasound pattern was to reduce biopsies. But if you look at the biopsy rates between 2009 and 2016, they keep going up. Now it's going to be 600,000 estimated thyroid biopsies this year. And it used to be you know, half that seven years ago. So wow. we're doing too many biopsies. What you don't want to do is add more candidates to that by screening the population. So Korea, South Korea, learned this in 2009. They thought as an added value to people getting breast imaging with mammogram and ultrasound, they would look at women's thyroid, just you know, added value. And the amount of papillary thyroid cancer skyrocketed in the next five years, reported in the New York Times in 2014. Finally, the Koreans you know, actually stopped doing that, and their uh, cancer rate has decreased. There was a nice paper that came out in the fall in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at the expected rates versus the observed rates of cancer. And the South Korea curve was I mean, just three to four times that of any other country that does still a lot of imaging. Um, so it was very interesting to see that. So we have learned that screening results in a lot of unnecessary procedures, costs, anxiety, and decreased quality of life. Yeah. Don't do it. Yeah, several of uh, my friends when I was having my uh, thyroid uh, nodule adventure said, is this common? And I said, I think it's really common. Really common. And they said, well, I better get checked out. Yeah. And of course, what do you think happened? Half of them had a nodule. Exactly. And right. then they went down a long rabbit trail rabbit uh, right. leading to needles and uh, all kinds of adventures. It's tough. I mean, you have to select patients. So if patients come in with a history of radiation exposure or a history of you know, multiple, two sisters with thyroid cancer, you know, screening might be reasonable right. in that regard. But uh, you don't screen, don't ultrasound the normal neck. Yeah. Right. <laughs> You'll find stuff you don't want Correct. to see. Yeah, if, exactly. you, if you start looking, you will You'll find. find. <laughs> That's it. You know, we discussed earlier that many of the newly discovered papillary microcarcinomas are not a major problem for most people. And, you know, they really don't require specific treatment. Uh, so given all that, would you say that observation should be the standard of care for, for non-palpable thyroid nodules under 10 millimeters? I think that active surveillance or observation is an option for those. Uh, once you've found one like that, then you have to do your checklist of, are there lymph nodes involved? Is there extension? Is this a person with a high-risk history of radiation exposure or familial uh, non-medullary thyroid cancer? And 
the, or is it multifocal? If you see a lot of these little three to four to five millimeter uh, foci, then you might be more concerned. So I think a lot of these patients can be offered surveillance, but it's gonna be up to the patient to make that decision and ideally done in a center that has a s active surveillance program. So. You know, we do some of that in our office, Memorial Sloan Kettering's doing that, MD Anderson's starting to do that. So you now are getting uh, you know, large groups of, of patients who are being watched. So we'll learn to make sure that the American or US experience is similar to what we saw in Japan uh, in their program, which proved that a lot of these patients can be safely watched. It was the younger patients that tended to progress. So um, so age factors in a little bit. So you might have a lower threshold with a 40 year old with a uh, eight millimeter uh, papillary cancer, just to go ahead and remove it at that point. Um, if it, if it, so it really depends. So, like any good answer in medicine, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> so, what are the quality of life consequences for patients who are unnecessarily treated for thyroid cancer? Yeah, so I, I break them up a little bit. So, one of it's medical. If you are treated with a total thyroidectomy, you become dependent on thyroid hormone. And with any hormone, it's always better to have your own endogenous production of hormone than to depend upon an exogenous source. I mean, the regulation of hormones within our body is so exquisite that to think you can take a pill once a day and have the same clinical uh, and physiologic impact is, is just completely incorrect. So from a quality of life standpoint, most people do fine, but if you look at patients who you know, have had a total thyroidectomy or have permanent hypothyroidism or who are dependent upon thyroid hormone, their quality of life tends to be lower than you know, normal, um, their normal age matched, uh, sex matched cohorts. Secondly, and there's cost associated with it. So if you have a thyroid cancer, you've got follow-up, you have maybe iodine scanning, you've got uh, testing that includes you know, how you test for thyroglobulin, which sometimes involves expensive medications. And so there's a rate of bankruptcy that generally in cancer patients, we see a higher rate of bankruptcy. But in one study, thyroid cancer imparted the highest risk of bankruptcy. So these patients um, suffer financially as well. Uh, so I think there's a lot of things that that, uh, that occur, you know, with you know, either over detection or over treatment of thyroid cancer. So can we talk about the options for people who end up with benign nodules? We've talked about thyroid cancer, but what about people who have benign nodules? Which is the majority. So most of these people come in. We go through this whole process. We say, hey, your nodule looks benign with a 97 to 99 percent certainty. And let's uh, see what we need to do. Most of them just come back every couple of years for an ultrasound to make sure there's no change in characteristics or significant growth or change in thyroid hormone status. But some of these patients have either cosmetic concerns or compressive concerns or their nodule is overactive. So if you have an overactive nodule, then you either remove it or you treat it with radioactive iodine, which is kind of exploiting that iodine uh, uptake that it, these thyroid... Uh, nodules have, if it's, um, or you can remove it as well. So that, that's, those are the options. If you have a benign cyst that keeps recurring, but is big enough to cause symptoms of trouble swallowing, choking, cosmetic concerns, then you can actually drain it and put a hundred percent ethanol into it and essentially, um, sclerose it. So it ends up, uh, is scarring it down a little bit and causing fibrosis. And so 75% of those will not reaccumulate fluid, which is quite a nice trick. Not commonly done yet in the US, but uh, I went to Italy to look at radiofrequency ablation, where you take a big, fairly big needle. Because when we talk about fine needle aspiration, we didn't say, re remind the listeners that this is fine needle aspiration and uses a needle smaller than a blood draw needle. So 27, 25 gauge needle, maybe three different times into the nodule, very easy procedure. Um, now, as we talk about radio frequency ablation, this is a big 18 gauge needle that's seven centimeters that has a radio frequency uh, emitter at the end of it. So it heats the nodule and burns the tissue, um, which works quite well. Also laser um, and then high intensity frequency ultrasound or HIFU, it's used for prostate mainly and somewhat bladder, mm -hmm. but uh, looking at that for uh, thyroid nodules. So we have current options that are non-surgical uh, in the US and some evolving ones that I hope to to, to get to use in the future. That's great. So there's reported to be a higher risk of papillary thyroid cancer in iodine replete areas. And there's a lot of epidemiological data that suggests that thyroid autoimmunity increases with iodine supplementation. 
So taken together, this leads me to wonder if the iodization of salt backfired to a certain extent and contributed to the increase in thyroid nodules, cancer, and autoimmunity. What are your thoughts? Maybe. Um, <laughs> you know, the iodine is critical to thyroid health. So it's, you know, if you don't have enough, you certainly see goiter. And if we look at goiter worldwide, the most common cause is iodine deficiency. So we know a lack of iodine is a problem. So then if we add iodine in proper amounts, then we probably see improvement without much uh, negative. But of course, with anything, we overdo it. So as you add more and more iodine, you tend to see more problems. So if you look at the Sri Lanka experience, they published this in 2014, uh, where you have an endemic goiter due to iodine deficiency. Initially, their iodine supplementation program decreased goiter rate. But then over the years, they saw that this started increasing again. And mm. if they measured thyroid antibodies in the population, it was much higher prevalence of 20% of antibody positive compared to before the iodine program. So maybe it was stimulating a dormant uh, predisposition towards autoimmune thyroid disease, something like that. That's probably it. But you certainly see uh, several models of increased autoimmunity with high iodine intake. So some of the non-traditional medicine advice often is to use a lot of iodine for thyroid health. And so what's the RDA of iodine? It's 150 micrograms, micrograms. For pregnancy, it's 250 micrograms. So if we talk about iodine health, the most important person is the pregnant woman. We need to make sure she has enough iodine because the thyroid is not developed until 10 weeks. We wanna make sure there's adequate iodine and for the baby, uh, it's thyroid development. So, so pregnancy is critical for uh, adequate iodine, but the RDA of iodine is 150 micrograms. I have patients who come in taking 12.5 milligrams whoa. Whoa, of <laughs> iodine per day. And most of them get away with it because a normal thyroid can deal with it. So this is interesting physiologically. If you have a thyroid that has an attack by the immune system, your usual ability to regulate iodine you know, storage and, and utilization is diminished. So this is something called the wolf chakoff effect. So the wolf chakoff effect means I can, if I get exposed to too much iodine, I can shut down my factory for a little bit and then turn it back on. But if you fail to escape that effect, you shut down your factory and it doesn't come back on. So people with autoimmune thyroid disease might have had normal thyroid function before these high doses of iodine, and then they, they just can't recover from the iodine overload and get profound hypothyroidism. We also see that in patients who get iodine contrast studies for CT scan. You know, one day their TSA, their thyroid function's normal, the next day they come in hypothyroid, not, or six weeks later, you always had to say, what happened with the eye? So iodine, a little bit of iodine is great for the thyroid, too much iodine could be a problem. And there's some models, especially in um, Asia, where the pathway to thyroid cancer rate is uh, proportionate to iodine status, and an increase maybe in BRAF, mutated pathway to thyroid cancer with iodine status. So there might be something to that. Uh, last year, the New York Times ran an article titled, It's Not Cancer, Doctors Reclassify a Thyroid Tumor, where they report on non-invasive follicular thyroid neoplasms with papillary-like nuclear features, which had previously been considered a kind of cancer. But poof, no longer. They've been downgraded to non-cancerous status and now go by the wonderful acronym NIFDP. Although nothing will have changed in the physical condition of these patients, the C word will have been removed from them along with much stress and worry, and their treatments are likely to be less aggressive. Can you talk a little bit about this recent shift in categorization and the likely consequences? Yeah, this is very new. I mean, it was this time last year where that journal article came out, and it was an international group of pathologists and surgeons and endocrinologists looking at this question of, we recognize that encapsulated follicular variant papillary thyroid cancer has a very indolent course. And so they thought, well, if we reclassify this and called it a tumor but not a cancer, could we clarify for patients and clinicians what the proper follow-up plan should be? So that's a very noble effort because if you've got 15, 20% in some studies of, of patients with follicular variant papillary thyroid cancer that really had this type of tumor called NIFT-P, then you change, you know, one, the psychology of the patient and two, your follow-up and cost. 
The problem is, once this paper got published, patients would call and say, was that me? And this is something that creates some ethical dilemmas in, in medicine, because now we have a new way of classifying something that we used to call a cancer, but we don't we want to remind patients that when you had that diagnosis five years ago, that was the current standard, and we can't go back and relook at everybody to see if they are truly NIFT-P. So as a clinician, though, if you had a patient that had an encapsulated, which means there was no invasion, so non-invasive or encapsulated follicular variant, papillary thyroid cancer with no areas of that tumor that had any aggressive um, histology no lymph nodes involved, we always knew that those were patients with an indolent course. So the treatment shouldn't change, really. Um, but patients are frustrated because we can't go back and relabel them without looking at the entire surgical specimen. And the pathologist just don't want to go back and recut all those slides and do that, right. as you know, from your pathology experience. So, <laughs> so this is something that is prospective. So moving forward from April 2016, now we have this option that a a uh, skilled pathologist can classify what used to be called a cancer into this NIFT-P tumor. Now, it needs to be removed. Part of the confusion then would be the patient would say, well, I didn't need surgery if this wasn't a cancer. But these are uncertain metastatic uh, potential. I mean, at the point of diagnosis, they are not invasive, but we think that this is a continuum potentially where it could become invasive in the future. Usually these have RAS mutations. It's early along and potentially these could become invasive and could metastasize. So if there is a clinically suspicious tumor, it needs to be removed, and if it was, and these NIFT-Ps need to be taken out. So I think that's the message is, when you talk about cytology and molecular testing and the positive predictive value for cancer, I think of it as the positive predictive value of needing surgery. So if you have a NIFT-P that came out, you needed surgery, just like if you had a cancer that came out. So. I think we're all trying to get our heads around it and talk to our patients about it, but um, it's it's an interesting concept. And same with the micro cancers, there's an interest in trying to change uh, that into you know micro tumors of uncertain significance or something. So there's you know, there's always this interest into trying to uh, recognize these very low risk situations and not call them cancers because the public perception of that and the financial impact of that sometimes for the insurance standpoint is is pretty tremendous. So, Mark, as we've discussed, much of your work you do in your office has to do with thyroid nodule diagnosis and trying to use clinical features to minimize unnecessary surgeries. And your work is also focused on using ultrasound to risk stratify the nodules. You actually travel around the country, from what I understand, teaching surgeons and endocrinologists how to do that, which must be a very rewarding activity. It's a lot of fun. I'm, I'm you know, humbled by my mentors who guided me into this thyroid track and who um, got me involved in teaching almost 10 years ago. And so the ability to, to share with other endocrinologists, with surgeons, with pathologists, and even radiologists who take the course, the, the different ideas that we have on how to recognize when a nodule is risky or not risky, when to biopsy it, how to do the biopsy. You know, these are two, two, often two full day courses that we teach on uh, good neck ultrasound uh, with hands-on ultrasound uh, models with with for biopsy and for with patients with disease. So it's it's a lot of fun to do. And I, I learn from my peers in teaching, and so it's a good sharing of ideas, and it it complements the clinical experience. So that you know, day in day out seeing patients, it's extremely rewarding. But it's always nice to put on a different skill set and to do something different. So the, the ability to to travel and teach and and do uh, those types of activities is is wonderful. I understand that you just received a teaching award. I know that you are a very modest fellow, <laughs> but can you tell us something about your new honor? So I am the 2017 recipient of the Jack Baskin Endocrine Teaching Award. So this is a award, I think, that started about eight or 10 years ago, and it's given by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, which is has a it's almost 6,000 domestic members and another 1,000 or so international members. It's the largest organization of clinical endocrinologists in the world. And the award is given to someone who is actively involved in teaching other endocrinologists and at the university level. And I do have a, a clinical 
assistant clinical professorship at the Florida State University College of Medicine. They have a location in Sarasota. And so I was very honored to to be the 2017 recipient of this, largely based on our coursework for ultrasound, fine needle aspiration biopsy, and thyroid cancer management. Mm, Well done. Congratulations. So we talked about your previous mountain climbing adventures. What else do you like to do in your spare time when you're not traveling around the country and doing everything else that you do? Uh, PowerPoints? No. (laughs) Oh, my God. I know. It seems like half of my Sundays is PowerPoints. But... um, well, we have a wonderful golden retriever, so we spend at least a half day on weekends and several evenings, you know, in the park or in the uh, pool with him. Um, we live near the water. I like to kayak and play tennis, uh, read. So it just, uh, yeah, those, those fleeting moments of free time uh, are enjoyed, certainly. Make the most of them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this was great fun, and uh, we will put links to your practice uh, in the show notes. And uh, we really appreciate you coming on STEM Talk. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. It was uh, a nice deep dive. Yes. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Don. Thank you, Ken. You're welcome. STEM Talk. 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 I really enjoyed chatting with Mark about his clinical practice and research. To give our listeners some perspective, we actually interviewed Mark when he was visiting IHMC for our evening lecture series, which we'll put up a link to on our show notes. When he asked the capacity crowd how many had either dealt with a thyroid nodule or thyroid cancer or knew someone who did, almost everyone in the room raised their hand, which is pretty remarkable. So his work definitely has far-reaching implications. Absolutely. Mark is a terrific doc who is at the very front edge of clinical practice and education regarding thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer. In this episode, we took a deep dive on this fascinating topic that has impacted so many. We appreciate Dr. Lupo taking time away from his busy clinical practice to join us on STEM Talk. Absolutely. If you enjoyed this interview as much as we did, I invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes, stemtalk.us. This is Don Carnegie signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.